I want to talk today about gas chromatography and chemistry, specifically in organic chemistry, because that's what we're going to be using it for in our class. And we use gas chromatography to analyze mixtures of samples in chemistry. And we encounter these frequently. For instance, we could do a reaction, and even though we're hoping to make one product, it results in a mixture of multiple products. Alternatively, we could have a sample that we isolated from somewhere. It could be a biological sample or soil sample or a water sample. And they quite frequently contain multiple compounds as well. When we have these mixtures, there's usually two, one of two things that we're going to try to do with them. We might want to separate and purify them so that the compound that we're interested in we can remove from all of the other compounds. And we've learned techniques for doing things like that this semester. These are techniques like distillation, extraction, and crystal recrystallization that we've already talked about, but also techniques we're going to talk about, such as chromatography. Alternatively, we may just want to analyze them. And that means measure the amount of each component in the mixture, rather than go through the whole trouble of separating them from one another. And by doing this, we can understand, if we're studying a reaction, for instance, the pathway that it's followed, figuring out the major and minor products form or it can help us identify components in a sample that we isolate as a mixture. For this, we're going to use chroma chromatography, and in particular, one useful form of chromatography for these types of experiments is gas chromatography. Gas chromatography is used to analyze mixtures of volatile compounds, and in particular, it separates compounds based on their boiling point. So things that are lower boiling travel faster through the gas chromograph, whereas things that are higher boiling travel slower. The general setup for a gas chromatogram, or a GC as it's often abbreviated, is shown in this sort of schematic diagram. Um, this is our sample. It's a mixture of volatile compounds. In this case, there are four of them, A, B, C, and D. And we have to have some way of getting... There's usually these are usually relatively low boiling liquids, and we have to have some way of getting this onto our column. It's usually injected by a syringe. There is a gas that flows through the GC. Sometimes it's hydrogen, sometimes it's helium, sometimes it's nitrogen, but I believe our GC uses hydrogen. And the carrier gas carries the compounds, the compound mixture, onto the column. The column is stored in an oven so that we can control the temperature that the column is at. This helps us fine-tune the separation of our compounds. They pass through the column. We'll talk about the nature of the column in a few minutes. There's some detector that detects a signal. The signal is usually proportional to the amount of the sample. And then the data is fed usually to some sort of computer-based system. The output we get looks something like this, where there is a peak corresponding to each product. The lower boiling compounds come out earlier. So in this case, A is the lowest boiling compound. In this case, D is the highest boiling compound because it comes out last. Also, the area under the peaks is usually proportional to the amount of compound. So in this particular case, we have the least of B in our sample, and we have the most of C in the sample. This is what a typical column looks like. You can see it's coiled many times over to maximum, maximize the length of column that we can fit in a specific size oven. If we look up a look at a cutaway and a magnification of what's going on in the column, we've got something like this, where the carrier gas, like I said, hydrogen, helium, or nitrogen gas, is flowing through the column. We call this the mobile phase because it's moving through the column. The column is packed with either some sort of bead or some are packed with a liquid polymer that clings to the side of the column. This is called the stationary phase because it does not move. It stays in the column. In this particular example, I've got a mixture of two compounds that I've injected into my gas chromatogram. One is represented by these blue spheres. The other is represented by these red spheres. And you can see what happens is that the compounds that are entered into the column or injected into the column stick to the, mobile, to the stationary phase. 
Samples that are injected on the column are in equilibrium between the solid phase and the mobile phase. So sometimes the blue and the red are stuck to the column and staying there. Other times they are vaporized and the carrier gas is pushing them along the column. The more time the sample spends on the solid phase, the slower it moves through the column. The more time a sample spends in the mobile phase, the faster it moves through the column. A compound with a lower boiling point will spend more time as a vapor and will be in the mobile phase more and it'll move through the column faster. So compounds with a lower boiling point come off the column first, with a higher boiling point come off the column last. So in the example that we're looking at as we flow carrier gas through the column, we can see that the blue compound has traveled farther and faster through the column and the red compound has traveled slower and not as far through the column. So in this case, the blue sample has a lower boiling point and it moves faster through the column. And the red compound is slower and has a higher, because it has a higher boiling point. So when I analyze this, the first peak I see will be due to my blue compound and the second one will be due to my red. So when I get my trace from the previous example, I will see a peak first. And I know that will be for the blue compound and I'll see my second peak, I'll know that be from the red compound because I know the boiling points of these components. I know the lower boiling point will come out first. Now a lot of times also in a GC trace, and it's not shown here, you will see a very small sharp peak at time equals zero. And this is usually due to air being in the sample or the syringe. It goes through the column very rapidly and gives what's called an air peak that we use as the time zero. In terms of the amounts of each of these samples, assuming the blue compound and the red compound are similar in uh, composition, so they react similarly with the detector, there's more blue compound than there is red compound because the area under this peak is greater than the area under the red peak. One last thing I want to mention to you is that if these peaks come out too close together, there are a few things we can do to adjust how far apart or how close together they are. One of the things we can do is we can raise the temperature or lower the temperature. Raising the temperature tends to make our peaks narrower and tends to make them come out faster because it causes more of the sample to be in the vapor phase at any given time. So that's one thing that can adjust the retention time of all our sample and potentially adjust how well separated these compounds are by adjusting the temperature. The other thing that we can do is we can adjust the flow rate of the gas. And again, a faster gas flow rate will cause the peaks to come out faster and be sharper, but it'll reduce the separation a little bit. So maybe a slower gas flow rate will help the peaks separate more, but the peaks in that case will be a little broader. These are things that are adjusted and played around with when you're trying to optimize the separation of the peaks.